go ahead and pull out your message notes. I'm excited about today. It's a message that's been in my heart for a couple of weeks. Uh, I do a daily Bible reading plan, and if you do not have one, I want to encourage you to do it. Uh, what it is, it's, it's saying, hey, every day I'm going to get into the Word of God. The one I use is the one-year Bible, uh, and it actually gives you a little bit of the New Testament, a little bit of Old Testament, gives you a Psalms, and then some Proverbs. It takes about 15 minutes to read it, and the thing that I love about it is that if I'll do it every single day, by the end of the year, I've read through the whole Bible. Uh, sometimes it's very daunting as a new believer to say, I'm going to read through the Bible. But I, I, I don't know if I can do it in a week or two weeks or two months, but I can do it in a year. I mean, no, I, can, I can read 15 minutes a day. And I want to encourage you to do that. This should not be the only time you get the Word of God inside your heart. We ought to be getting it inside of us on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And then Sunday is just like an overflow fill up. Can I get an Amen. <clears throat> so I want to encourage you to do that. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was reading through my one-year Bible, and we were on John chapter 11. Now, it's a story that I have read many times. I've heard it many times in my life. If you've been around Christianity, you'll know this story. If you're brand new, don't worry, I'll catch you up, and you'll, you'll get the story this morning. But it's the story of a man named Lazarus. Uh, Lazarus is a friend of Jesus, uh, and Lazarus has a sickness in his life. Now, with this sickness, it actually causes him to die. And in the story, we see Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, send for Jesus before Lazarus is dead and says, hey, Jesus, your friend, I mean, no, they, don't you love the, 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 the punch in there? Hey, your friend, not just a stranger, Jesus, but your friend. Hey, your friend is sick. And so Jesus is ministering uh, some distance away, and you would think that Jesus would stop everything to go and heal his friend, but that's not what we see happen in the scriptures. Jesus actually stays a couple of more days. He does ministry. Um, and then what happens because he stays is Lazarus actually dies. Now, how many have ever been frustrated about God's timing? How many know God's timing is not our timing? Isn't it funny, in this story, when you look at it, it's like, hey, Jesus, come on, man, why, why are you going to let him die? Like, you should have been there, and he wouldn't have died. But, but I'm, I've learned this, God's never early, but he's never late, he's always right on time. And so in our life, we can be assured of this fact for each and every one of us. And so now Jesus goes to visit Lazarus. He's been dead for four days. I'm going to read some scripture, and then I want to share some thoughts that I felt the Holy Spirit put in my heart to share this morning. John 11, verse 1. It says, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Verse 3, it says, So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your friend is very sick. And then we'll skip down to verse 6 and 7. It says, So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, Let's go to Judea. And then verse 17. Now, if you want to get all the picture, there's a lot of things happening. Feel free to go back and read it. But for time's sake, we're going to skip ahead. Verse 17, it says, On his arrival... Jesus found that Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. So Lazarus is dead. He's died. Um, and we don't know what kind of a sickness he had. The Bible doesn't reveal this. The only thing we know is that that sickness led to his death. And as I was reading the story, I couldn't help but see Lazarus as a picture of us. See, each and every one of us, we have a sickness that leads to death. Now, I know if you're sitting here this morning, you could say, look, pastor, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I'm not sick physically. I'm healthy. I am whole. Everything's great. Some of you are like, I'm in the best shape of my life. Some of you are like, I'm in the worst shape in my life, but I'm still not sick. Come on, somebody get another donut. It's awesome. And so we know that physically we may not be sick, but what I need us to know is that this is not true spiritually. That spiritually, we are all born with a sickness, and that sickness is called sin. Now, sin is a disease that plagues our heart, and I'm going to teach a little bit this morning uh, on this fact. So it's a, it's a sickness, but it doesn't plague us physically. It plagues our heart. Look at Jeremiah 17, 9. It says, the heart, everybody say heart is deceitful. And then look, I love the way this translation says, it says it's desperately sick. 
Like, who can understand it? So in other words, you know, your heart will lie to you and say, I'm good, I'm fine, I'm great. And the truth is, you're not fine, you're not great, you are desperately sick. Like, there's something wrong with us on the inside. It's, it's not a sickness that you asked for. You didn't do anything to deserve it. It's kind of like a birth defect. You know, when you have a baby that's born with a birth defect, that baby didn't ask to have a birth defect. That defect was passed on from generations past. Well, our sickness that we have was passed on from generations past. In fact, we received it from Adam and Eve. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 12. I'm going to lay a foundation. It says, look, when Adam sinned, so Adam and Eve, there are great, 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 great grandparents. They sin. Look at what happened. Sin now entered into the world. So there was no sin before they chose to sin. Now it's entered into the world and it says, Adam's sin, not your sin, not my sin, but Adam's sin brought death. And so death spread to everyone for everyone sinned. So it is in our nature. It is what we were born with. It's from the very time you were a child, we have this sickness called sin in our hearts. Now somebody say, well, what is sin? Sin is simply missing the mark. God's standard is perfection. God's standard is holiness. So sin is any time we miss the mark of God in our life. When he asks us to do something, when we do what's not right, we do evil. Any of those things, that is sin that we are doing in our life. It's not reaching or meeting the standard of God, which is perfection. And sin is a part of the human nature. David acknowledges this in Psalms 51.5. Look, it says, surely I was sinful at birth. Now think about it, a baby, sinful at birth. And then look, he says, I was conceived in my mother's womb. It was there at conception. You didn't ask for this sickness. You didn't deserve it when you were conceived. And yet we see that this sickness is a part of our life since conception. Now, I, I mean, you don't have to learn to sin. Anybody agree? I mean, how many know sinning comes pretty easy? Anybody who's not nodding your head, you're a bunch of liars. Sinning is natural. I mean, anybody got kids? Anybody ever been around kids? How many know you don't have to teach a kid to be selfish? I, people say the first word my child learned was mom, dad, you're lying. The first word they learned was mine, mine. Mine, toy, mine, mine. No, no, I bought that. No, mine. Like, they, it's mine. Like, like they, they're going to bring everything to them. You didn't have to teach the baby that word. You didn't have to teach them. You didn't have to teach them how to steal. You ever watch kids play? They just steal stuff. You're like, dang, he just got jacked. Wow, she done got her. You know, it's like, dang, they're stealing all. Like, you don't have to teach them that. They're going to they're go in there, and they're going to steal it either inadvertently or advertently. They don't care. They're going to go get what they want, regardless of who it hurts. Can I get an amen? And some adults act like kids. Anyway, that's a whole nother topic. But you don't have to teach them to lie. Like, you don't have to teach a child to lie. I don't know. Maybe your kids are perfect. My kids... Please don't put them on. They're not perfect. I mean, I, I remember even recently, just a couple of weeks ago, Phyllis bought a bag of chocolates. And we just asked the kids, look, can you not eat the chocolate before dinner? I'm not even saying you're not getting some. We're going to give it to you. But can we just have it for dessert? And, you know, kids are a little upset. Oh, mom, we want chocolate. No, 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 no. We're just going to wait. They're all like, okay, we can wait. Well, a little while longer, I'm, I'm in the kitchen helping to cook in one of my daughters who will remain nameless to protect the guilty <laughs> walks in and she has this smile you, know, you ever know that mischievous smile parents you know you're like something's not right like and so you just and as cute as my girls are and I just hey come see and she's like what and she got this little smile and I said hey baby I said did you get into the chocolate that mom said not to get into and she just looks me dead in the eyes and she has this smile she says no <laughs> like look me eyeball to eyeball like you figure look this is your daddy your boo you know your man come on you're not gonna look me square in the eyes and lied and here's what I know she had chocolate sitting right here on her lip the whole time <laughs> oh really sweetheart you 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 didn't get into the let, let me just oh what's this baby and then now she's confessing like, I mean, no, you don't have to teach children to lie. 
It's part of your DNA. It's part of our nature. It's part of who we are as people. And it was passed on from generations past. And, and that's why what we have to do as parents, we got to teach kids how to fall in love with Jesus. We have to teach kids at a young age how to have a relationship with God. And it's not your mom's relationship with God. It's not your dad's relationship with God. You as a child have to have an authentic life-giving relationship. Why? Because God needs to change your very nature. That's why we got to teach kids values. You're not just going to be born with good values. You got to teach it. You got to teach children how to have morality. They say that a child's morality is pretty much locked in by the age of five. What is that? That's the, the sense of what's right and what's wrong. And so it's things that we have to instill in their life. Why? Because we're sinful. And we've got to understand that sin has to be dealt with just like any other sickness. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 23. It says, the wage of sin is death. Think about that. That's why I say we, like Lazarus, have a sickness that leads to death. Now, when we say wage, that implies what you deserve. When you sin, you earn the result of that sin, and that is death. That's what the penalty of sin is. God's word clearly declares it. Now, I understand where we can look at it and say, look, when I sin, I don't die physically. And that's true for the most part. I mean, I mean, no, if you lie, you're not going to die, hopefully. If you steal or cheat, you're not going to die. I mean, there are rare occasions where someone's lie ends up in a death. But for the most part, we don't die instantly physically. Which is why we get deceived, because we can look around and say, well, it doesn't really matter. But the truth is, it does matter, because sin separates us from God. And we know that God is eternal life, that all life is found in God and through God. And so when we are separated from God, we experience what we call spiritual death. And that's why on the inside, before Jesus, you're like, man, I'm dying on the inside. Something's not right. It's like you get all the busyness, all the stuff. You can go to other religions, but the truth is nothing satisfies. And then you have an encounter with Jesus, and you're connected to the life of this world. And so we understand that it's relational separation from God, that though we are physically alive, we are spiritually dead apart from God. Now, as we continue with the story, Mary and Martha, they send for Jesus to heal Lazarus. They knew that Jesus was the only one that could heal Lazarus from this sickness. And just like Lazarus, look, Jesus is the only one that can cure us from our sickness. There is no other religion that can cure you from the sickness. There's no other person. There's not an idol. There's not a false God. And definitely you and I cannot heal ourselves and cure ourselves from this sickness. How many know you're not good enough? I'm not good enough. You're not disciplined enough? I'm not disciplined enough. We don't have what we need for the cure. Jesus is the cure. Look, if you continue to read Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says, for the wages of sin is death, but, everybody say but. Look, it says, but the free gift of God is eternal life. So the opposite of death is life, and not even just life, but it's eternal life. And then look at what it says, in who? Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus is the answer to the sickness that we have been plagued with. It's not, it's not other things, it's not other people, it's not other religions, it's Jesus. And God through Jesus gives us eternal life. And as believers, we term this, and if you're new to church, you'll hear it, we say salvation. We've experienced salvation. And really where we get that from is, look, Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Peter talking of Jesus, look at what he says. He says, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Jesus is the cure for the sickness in our life. Salvation is the cure for the sickness in our life. So we ask ourselves this morning, have we received the cure for the sickness in our lives? And most of you have. Most of you have had what we would call a salvation experience. But there are some of you here, you haven't. And I just want you to get ready. At the end of the service, I'm going to extend an invitation for you to experience the cure to our sickness. We continue with the story. Jesus gets to the tomb and 
If if you're familiar with it, Lazarus has been buried. The crowd of people are there with Jesus looking around. In verse 39, look at what happens. Jesus tells them, take away the stone. Remove it. Get rid of it. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an offensive odor, for he has been dead for four days. And then I love what she says right here. This is the amplified version. It says it's hopeless. Anybody ever had a hopeless situation? Anybody had a marriage that seemed hopeless? A child that seemed hopeless? A job that seemed hopeless? Maybe it's anxiety and fear. There's a situation in your life that's dead and buried and you think there's no hope. I need you to know there's hope and his name is Jesus. And, and I love this. It's I mean, just imagine with me, here we are, we're at this tomb, and Lazarus has been dead now for four days. Now, his body smells, smells at this time, so decomposition of a body, decomposing of a body begins 24 hours after death, and back then, they wouldn't have had any refrigeration, so they say, actually, within six hours, the body starts to decompose. And at this stage, when Jesus arrives on the scene, there would have been blood and foam coming from his mouth and nose. I mean, it would have been rank. You would have smelled it. You probably would have thrown up. It would have made you sick. And at this moment, the thing I love about Jesus is that though he was dead, that though he had eroded on the inside out, God was not scared of his mess. God was not scared of his odor. God was not scared of his death because he is the resurrection in life. The stench of death doesn't concern God. See, I think sometimes we go to church and people are like, well, what are they going to say? Listen, we ain't going to say nothing. You smell like death. You are in the right place. Your dreams have died. You're in the right place. Your marriage has died. You're in the right place. There's a God in heaven that will resurrect your life. And so it's not God that's afraid of the stench of death in people's lives. It's us. But I need you to know that God loves you. He cares for you. He's wanting to move away the stone. And the way I look at it is that God wants to remove the barriers in your life. Jesus removed the stone. See, that stone was what protected them from the odor. And there's moments in our lives where we've got walls up. we got barriers up. We're like, God, you can come this far, but no further. God, you can get this close, but no closer. And we begin to push away the very one that is there to resurrect what the devil has stolen. God wants to remove those barriers. And it's, it's easy. Look, you come to a church like this and God has blessed us. We're growing. You can come in on a Sunday. You can go out on a Sunday. You can meet people. You cannot meet people. So you come in and you get a feel-good supercharge. But the truth is, many people still come in with walls up, never having experienced the power of God. They isolate themselves. They push people away. They run away from God and even church and become workaholics. We begin to medicate our lives and numb our lives with leisure and entertainment. The truth is, we keep the pain concealed and we keep our true condition hidden just so we can exist. But I love it. Look, after he rolls away the stone and he removes the barrier, which God wants to do in some of your lives today. Some of you have been walking around with these walls up and God's going to remove that. Look at what Jesus does next. In verse 43, it says, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And it says, the dead man came out, his hands and feet were bound in grave clothes, his face was wrapped in a head cloth, and Jesus told them, unwrap him and let them go. Now, Jesus in this moment does what is impossible. He defies the natural. He raises Lazarus from the dead, and it's an amazing story. You can just imagine Lazarus walking out of that tomb. And this is what I find so interesting. This is what the Lord really spoke to me a couple of weeks, that though he was alive, he was still bound. And if we think about that, we can come to church, respond to the salvation call. We've come to church and have a salvation experience. Maybe it was here, maybe it was somewhere else. And now you think, man, my life should be totally different. Now it ought to be totally uh, different from when I walked in. You think I got new thoughts I should have new spirit and heart and and emotions and will and and all the addictions of the past, they shouldn't plague me anymore. My marriage ought to be perfect. Why? Because I responded to the salvation call. My money ought to get right. Why? Because I received Jesus. And what you have to know is that you can be resurrected to new life and still bound up in old grave clothes. 
And then people come in and they're frustrated. They're like, but I thought I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And I have to tell you this, if you feel like you've had that experience, you probably have. But just like Lazarus, this is what's interesting. There was another step. Huh. You mean after the resurrection from the dead, there's another step? Let Look at Lazarus' case. It's very interesting in this because Lazarus couldn't unbind himself. He couldn't loose himself from the glory of clothes. And I find it so interesting that Jesus didn't. Oh, Jesus could have. Jesus could have walked over and said, come here, my friend, do this. No, no. What Jesus does is what has shocked me and perplexed me. And the thing that grabbed my heart was Jesus invited people to come be a part of the miracle of resurrection. Isn't that amazing? Because he tells them, he says, look, you go loose him. So God uses those who love you to loosen you. You go be a part of this miracle. See, that's the part of the supernatural and the natural working together. That God's got his hand in it and then he invites people to come and be a part of setting other people free. And for those of you that have experienced the freedom that God has brought to your life, it is now our responsibility. I would say even further, our commission to make sure that we are helping others get unwrapped in the grave clothes that they have been stuck in for their whole life. See, God uses people to help us experience freedom. People. People set Lazarus free. Of course, we know Jesus is the one that resurrected him, but people are the ones that helped him get unbound. And think about this. Flawed, messed up, imperfect people are the ones that God used. Last I checked, I don't know of any perfect people. And sometimes the enemy would say, well, you're messed up. Yeah, I'm messed up, but I've got a little more freedom than them. I bet I can help them get out of what God got me out of. The devil is a liar. He's the father of lies. And you absolutely can be a part of God's miracle of helping people experience freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from the old life. Freedom from the old thoughts, the old ways, the old desires, and and even the old wounds and pains. I love it because God wants to heal us from that. He doesn't expect us, look, I I don't know about you, I don't want to just make it into heaven. I I love it. I'm grateful. My eternity is secure. I'm going to heaven. But I want to bring heaven to earth. What would it look like if God had a man, a woman, a church, a body of believers that were fully freed from the past and the bondage and the pain and all the addictions and all the things. And we are reaching out to a community that is desperately sick, looking for a cure to the sickness, which is their sin and disease. What would happen? You know what happened? Revival. What would happen? We'd change the world. This church here in Rosenberg, Texas would change the world. Why? Because we didn't get stuck. We didn't stay where we were at. We didn't allow the enemy to lie to us and to cause us to retreat. But we took steps forward. We advanced God's kingdom and we brought heaven to earth. God uses people. Look at James 5.16. It says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you would be healed. Now, sometimes we get this confused because it's confess your sins to God and he is faithful and just to forgive us. God forgives us, people heal us. Tell me that ain't kind of crazy. You're like, what, what, what? Just write this scripture down and go look at it as long as you need to look at it. That's God's invitation for what? For intimacy with people. That into me you can see, and because you see it, now I am free. We have got to let God use people to bring freedom into our lives. And the walls we build up don't do anything but hurt us and keep us from experiencing God's best. It's amazing. If we're not careful, we're going to miss out on experiencing God's best. And then we'll blame God and we'll blame people and we'll blame everything else. But the truth is we missed it because we missed a step. Fully alive, fully alive. God, I want to be fully alive. See, you can come down and get prayer for freedom all day long. And I believe God will do it. But that's just a part of it. The truth is, you cannot bypass the process if you want to get to the promise. And all throughout Scripture, God's promise of freedom comes through relationships. So no matter how much you don't like it, no matter how bad you've been hurt or offended or the past has got you down, you will eventually, if you want to experience freedom, have to let people into your life. You're going to have to engage with people and say, I love you. You love me. Let's be the church together. Freedom comes through relationships. 
And, you know, that's why we're a church of small groups. We're launching 74 small groups today, this morning. Yeah. Oh, wow. Woo! Woo! Come on, y'all can do better than that. Can y'all do a little bit, a little more excited? Okay. (laughs) Small groups are not just, see, that's where people think, well, that's just something, you know, you guys are trying to keep people busy. No, 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 listen, I promise you, we're not trying to give you something else to do. How many need one more thing to do? You want just to busy your skin? No, no, no. Everybody's busy. And here's what I know about small groups. When you understand that this is God's process for me to experience freedom in my life, now small groups, they're not just an option, they're a priority. I can't live my life without a small group. Why? Because every season of my life, God is freeing me from more things than I was freed from in the past. Listen, I wish, wouldn't it be awesome if we just had a pill that we put in our mouth and all of a sudden we're perfect. The past is healed, all addictions are gone. I mean, we just like that fat loss pill, you know, do something, keto or something, I don't know, something. It'd be amazing. I have a love-hate relationship with this thought process because it's like, God, why didn't you just make us, like, we're saved, just make us perfect, because your spirit's perfect. So that's a whole nother topic. When the spirit of God comes on the inside of you and you're alive, it's perfection. It's our will. It's our mind. It's our soulish area, the mind, will, and emotions. That's what has to be transformed into God's presence. That's what has to be renewed on a daily basis. But wouldn't it be awesome just, boo, I'm perfect. Look, you're never going to be perfect until you cross over into eternity. So the goal is I want to be more healthy today than I was yesterday. I want to be more healed today than I was yesterday. Our lives are like an onion, and you think that God's doing a deep work. He's like, oh, baby, we're just on the surface. Just keep moving. You're like, oh, God, it hurts so much. He's like, I'm just on the outer layer, baby. So you think even a pastor, you know, somebody hated on me on a Google review or something. It was, he, was, he was like, I don't want to be in a place where the pastor's in a hospital. He's supposed to be the physician. No, Jesus is the great physician. We are all in a hospital, baby. I just need you to know we all have a propensity for the sin and sickness that's in our heart. And God forbid us ever put ourselves on a pedestal that say I'm immune from that. And so even today, I need small groups more than I needed them in the past. I need relationships. And look, my small group, man, we meet every week. And it's amazing. Those guys have become some of my best friends, people that we expose our lives to. When our marriages are good, we talk about it. When our marriages are bad, we talk about it. When our kids are living for God, we talk about it. When they're not, we talk about it. When work is good, when when life is good, when life is bad, every area of our life, what we do is we expose it. And we say, would you pray with me? Help me. What am I not seeing? Help me walk this out. It's the most freeing thing. I didn't come from a church of small groups. Listen, I remember, and I didn't tell this to the first service. I remember when, when I, I felt like this was the, the, the philosophy and the theology that God was birthing us out of. We've done small groups from day one. I came from a church. We tried to do small groups. And I was over them. I couldn't get eight small groups together. Mine had like three people. I'm like, wow, whoo, y'all must really love me. And I remember getting ready for this. My mentor and pastor, Pastor Chris Hodges, said, you can't not do it. Like if you want, like this is part of the discipleship process. And so I remember just feeling afraid, like God, can we do it? And then just to see lives change. And then more than that, my life changed. I'll never forget I was in a freedom small group, which if you've never been to freedom, you got to go to freedom. I've done it three times. It is the best small group you could ever possibly go into. And I'll never forget sitting around the table, church a couple of years old, and I'm thinking, well, I'm going to help these people get freedom. And God says, no, I'm going to give you freedom. And we're just talking about the curriculum. And, and all of a sudden, I began to weep and cry. And what I realized was God was my father, but I felt like I had to perform for his love. That didn't happen on a Sunday morning. God didn't reveal that to me. God didn't reveal that in my quiet time. He didn't reveal that in my worship time. He revealed that among brothers and sisters that sat around my table and said, Pastor, just go ahead, let it all out. Whatever God's exposing, you allow him to expose it. We're going to cover you. We're going to love you. We're going to be here for you. And God began to expose that area of my life. And it set me free from a performance mentality. I don't have to perform for God's love. Good, bad, doesn't matter. God loves me. Good decisions, bad decisions. God loves me. But all of those years, every year, it's just a new breakthrough, new breakthrough. Why? Because God uses people to help us experience freedom. And ultimately, you have to understand God never intended for us to do life alone. I know it's hard. I know it. 
when you've been hurt by people, and, and that's, <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny. Somebody says, what's the best thing about pastoring a church? What's the worst thing? People and people. <laughs> Why? Because people are people. But you know what you have to be careful of? Don't let others cause you to lose out on what God wants to do in your life. You have to love them. You have to forgive them. You have to just say, hey, we bless them. God, I'm not. Because it's, listen, this, this is what I learned. It's not the people doing it anyway. It's the enemy using them to try to destroy us. And when you recognize that, you accept people for what they are. Flawed, messed up, passionate. Look, we, we love Jesus one moment and then act like the devil the next. Come on, somebody. Yeah, you, you know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all, not me. Yeah, right. Look at Peter, right? He sits there and tells, he's like, Jesus, I'll, I'll do anything. I, all these good things out of his mouth. And then the devil uses him to tell Jesus, you're not going to die like that. Jesus tells Peter, get behind me, Satan. If Satan can speak through Peter, who was an apostle that sat right there with Jesus, I know that Satan could use us at times. So we just got to go back. Because my weapon is not against them. It's, it's, it's praise. It's worship. God, you're my defense. It's not people. And then we begin to pray for people. And then what happens is those that hurt you, when you begin to pray for them, now you love them more than ever because you realize how lost they are, how desperate they are. And you realize this truth that hurting people hurt people. So wow, God, it had nothing to do with me. It had to do with their pain. So then you begin to have compassion for them. It's the best thing and the worst thing. I'm going to tell you, you can come to this church all you want for the rest of your life. But if you don't get in a small group, if you don't find a tribe of people to do life with, you're never going to experience the freedom that God wants you to experience. I found it very interesting. There was a study that I read in Forbes. And it was talking about babies that were raised in an orphanage. It talked about how that even babies need physical touch, they need affection, they need to be loved. The research was actually done in 1940 and it was talking specifically about the dangers of institutional care. That's where you have people caring for babies that do not belong to them. And the challenge in this study was there were far way more babies than the, the workers could actually care for and love on. And so while the workers were giving them food and changing their diapers and kept them in a safe, clean environment, the study found something out that was very interesting, that those babies needed more than food, they needed more than a clean environment, they actually needed physical love and touches and the voice of someone that cared for them. In fact, if they didn't get it, 37% of those babies died. Died. They didn't die because of a sickness, didn't die because of a disease, they didn't die because they were malnourished or needed water. They died because they had no physical touch. They died from loneliness and neglect. And what they call this is the failure to thrive syndrome. And here's my concern. I wonder how many are sitting in here. Oh, you made it past the early stages of childhood, but as an adult, you have this syndrome on the inside. You're dying. You're dead because you failed to thrive. You're emotionally disconnected. You're relationally on an island. You have no real relationships, so you're desperate, but you won't let anybody in. You're lonely. You've been neglected emotionally, but you are the key to experiencing God's freedom in your life. Nobody can make you have relationships. Nobody can make you get around people. And once we understand this, and this is why I felt so strongly to share, see, now you know. See, before you can say, I don't know why I'm not thriving. I don't know why. See, some of you had not been thriving in your marriage. You had not been thriving in your kids. You had not been thriving in your job. You had not been thriving in your dreams. Like your life is dying. It is a failure to thrive syndrome. And the truth is, if you evaluate your life, your walls have been up for so long. People aren't around you. And here's the thing. I can make it. No, you can't. I'm strong. Yeah, you're strong, but you're not that strong. I'm good enough, yes, but you're not that good. Why? Because this is the process that God created for us to experience freedom. It's all throughout the Bible. Relationships. 
You can't bypass it if you want the promise. And this morning, my prayer, as I was praying, even the Holy Spirit, I was just telling that people would learn two things. Number one, some of you need the cure to your sickness. You're sitting here. Maybe you've been coming to church long enough. There's never been a more clear gospel message than right now about the condition of your heart. You'll never be good enough. Religion will lie to you and say, if you do enough good things, maybe it'll outweigh the bad things and you'll flip into heaven. You maybe stumble into heaven. You're not going to stumble into heaven. There's one way, and his name is Jesus Christ. And I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. It's a prayer of repentance. It's a prayer of surrender. You're in the right place. But for those, there's, there's another group that I felt real strong about. It's those that have put up walls. So you've experienced salvation. You've experienced this resurrection life. But the truth is you've been frustrated and now you know. So what do you have to do? You have to lower the walls and you have to take the initiative. Oh, I don't want to. It's uncomfortable. You're right. It's uncomfortable. Oh, it's hard. It's hard. I mean, have you ever sat in a room with people that you don't know? Awkward. Come on, somebody. Maybe it's just me. I'm like, what do I say? What do I do? You're not the only one. I went to a meeting just even the other night. I had, it was a big social out in the city. And I'm like, man, this is really weird. Just being out with people. I don't know. It's, it is weird. It takes a little courage. Anybody ever get a little nervous before you get out the car? You're like, I'm not sure that I really want to do this. Well, no, don't I have something to do? Come on. So there's always an excuse. Look, you're never going to find time. You got to make time. You're never just going to have it happen. You got to make it happen. Why? Because I'm so desperate. I'm so hungry to get rid of the past, to get rid of the things that have bound me up. God, I need your freedom. And I'm desperate enough to do something that's uncomfortable. Just desperate enough. Just desperate enough. But the only way that happens is you got to lower the walls. You got to let God in. You got to let people in. And this is what I know. This church will love you. People will love you. We've been training our small group leaders. Look, it's like, man, we're not perfect. You're not perfect. It's all right. We, we all fit. The devil is a liar, and he continues to lie to you because he wants you to stay bound up. But now you know. Father, I pray for each person. Lord, I sense there are those that have been hurt in the past. And Lord, they've lived in the pain of being bound up. They've experienced salvation, but the truth is, God, right now I'm asking you, would you help them to have relationships? Allow them to get close to people that can loosen them, just as you designed, that you invite us to be a part of the miracle. And Lord, I pray that every pain of the past you touch now, every hurt now, And God, that our faith would be in you, that you've led us to the right place, that God, if you led us to this church, there's a reason why. And God, I pray nothing would stop us, that we would make a resolve in our heart, just like Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the king's food. God, I'm asking you not to let us walk away without a resolve to connect with people. God, give us that resolve, 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 resolve. Holy Spirit, do your work. Holy Spirit. Maybe you could just talk to him right now. His presence, he's in this place. You can feel him. Father, we just thank you, Lord Jesus. Come on, just right where you're at. Just tell him. Maybe it's a pain. I, I sense somebody has a deep pain. Even me just saying that, you just, it kind of touched a nerve. You're like, ah, oh, that's, that's, look, God is in this place. He can heal that pain. And I believe even now, supernaturally, he is touching that place that has hurt so bad just because it's time for you to take your next step you've been asking God why am I stuck here's why you're stuck now it's your move father whoever that is Lord I pray you just touch them minister to them give them grace that God you you move in an unprecedented way Lord I thank you Jesus thank you father just feel his presence Lord we're so God, do your work. God, I thank you, Father. Lord, we worship you, Jesus. You know, sometimes we've got to get in the habit of just waiting on God. Look, all your problems are going to meet you when you leave that door. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Can we, can we not rush to just get out when his presence is here? It's like, look, everything you're facing, it's already out there. Just God, I pray for hope. 
Even when we read this scripture in the Amplified Version where it says, it is hopeless. Someone in this place said, that's my situation. God, I pray that you would resurrect that. That God, what seems dead, what's dying, the even have decomposing elements of it, God, I pray that you would restore back to health, not just the way it was, but better. Do what only you can do, God. We thank you for this.